planning made it a priority. Uh, they've been working very hard, and I think it's uh, uh, it's timely to be able to hear from uh, some of the major players. So we got a lot of great folks here today. Obviously, Eric Sutton, Director, Executive Director of Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, we have Gil McRae, the Director of the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Uh, we have our Interim DEP Secretary, Sean Hamilton. We have our former Chief Science Officer, Tom, Dr. Tom Frazier, now at the University of South Florida College of Marine Science. Uh, we have Dr. Kate Hubbard, Research Scientist with Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Michael Crosby, President and CEO of Moat Marine, who we work very closely with uh, on these issues. And then we have Marty Herity, uh, co-owner of Doc Ford's Rum Bar and Grill, which is a great spot uh, down in Sanibel, and I know he's been involved uh, in a lot of these issues for, for many, many years. Um, uh, when, we, uh, when I came into office, we had gone through, before I took office, 2018, uh, which was a, um, a season, particularly in the southwestern part of Florida, uh, where you had really, really severe red tide, and it caused... Um, uh, a lot of problems that affected the economy and tourism, and uh, it was a major issue, particularly in that part of the state, but we've also seen uh, red tide historically up and down uh, the, the western coast of Florida, and has really been documented since, uh, I think, the 1840s in Florida as something that, that happens. So when I came into office, we signed our environment executive order, uh, directed action to ensure protection of uh, environment water quality, uh, focusing on collaboration, uh, scientific advances, and transparency. Uh, we called for uh, the reorganization of the Red Tide Task Force, which had been dormant uh, for the previous 15 years. And so this is a task force that's comprised of leading scientists and researchers and plays an important role determining strategies to research, monitor, control, and mitigate uh, red tide and other algal blooms in Florida's waters. Uh, after a comprehensive review of recent experiences in scientific literature, the task force identified recommendations to fill information gaps, improve communications, and enhance research and innovation. Now, also, the task force established a grant program to address these recommendations, which funded projects to improve statewide red tide communication and real tide detection of red tide. The task force continues to meet quarterly to find solutions uh, to the very complex and unpredictable issues uh, affiliated with red tide. Um, these efforts are supported by the Center for Red Tide Research at Florida uh, FWC. Uh, I recommended the creation of the Center for Red Tide Research in my first budget back in 2019. The center was established uh, within the Research Institute and has received $4.8 million each year since 2019 to detect, track, and mitigate uh, red tide and to support the task force. Additionally, I also signed into law in 2019 uh, Senate Bill 1552, which established the Red Tide Mitigation and Technology Development Initiative. This initiative is a partnership between FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and Moat Marine Laboratory to develop technologies and approaches to control and mitigate red tide and its impacts, and they'll be discussing some of the things that they've been doing. Uh, this bill included an annual appropriation of $3 million per year for six years, uh, totaling $18 million, and more than 20 projects are currently underway. Uh, so I want to thank everybody that's been involved. I think we have some of the, the best in the business who are um, who are looking at these issues and researching the issues, and obviously we've put our money where our mouth is by uh, by devoting a lot of resources to be able to uh, uh, to, to to do all we can um, to help uh, to mitigate any effects. So we're going to go around. Uh, everyone's going to say um, what's on their mind. We'll have a, probably a discussion after that. So we'll start with Eric Sutton. Thank you, Governor. Um, and it was, I think, day two or three, uh, you came at, uh, after you were elected and, and talked about water quality and including red tide. So we appreciate your uh, support very much. One of, the, one of the key things to manage red tide is communication. And that's something that I feel like we've made great strides in uh, since we've taken office. For instance, we have a, an interactive map out there, and anyone can go to it within a matter of a couple of clicks to see in almost real time where red tide is occurring. And often it's, it's patchy, it's uh, localized, it's not widespread, and it's important for us to communicate that. You probably hear from Marty why that's important. Um, we also have a weekly update, so you can look at the map, you can read what's going on. You can do it right now and find out, you know, there's some patchiness up off of Dunedin uh, or the, off the Honeymoon Island area. Um, but also what we do, and we have uh, 
developed is a network with our partners, our partners being you know, local governments, local uh, tourism officials, um, weekly. We've done that weekly since, just to let them know we're available, give them the right information, because we want the right information to be out there so that it helps protect the economy, because we know um, red tide can do that as well. So we, we have uh, communication is a key uh, strength, and, and it's also cross-linked, uh, Sean, with you know, uh, protecting Florida together. There should be no reason anyone can't quickly find out, is there, is there red tide, where is it, and, and what, how can I plan around it? So that's, communication's been a real important element, and uh, we're pretty proud of, of what we put together and under your direction, so thank you. So, and how is that different between, you know, you go back, I don't know, even like 10 years ago, I mean, obviously, you know, red tide is something that, that we see uh, annually in some form. Uh, we go back 10 years, what would have been uh, somebody's ability to, to identify what was going on? It, it would, you'd have to navigate through, a, uh, if you went on the web, a, a few more clicks, but also the map wasn't updated like every, every day. Um, so you would have old maps kind of uh, showing and it wasn't as refined. We've expanded our, our ability to sample with a lot of different partners, so you have more uh, sampling locations, which provides more accuracy, and it's more real time than it was 10 years ago. And great leaps in uh, technology has helped us communicate better. Great, okay, Sean? Well, just to, I think to echo what Eric's saying, communication's been the key, right? Working on the platforms, and this, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of science, but if you can't consume it in real time, a value add for the purpose of whether that's tourism, whether that's for science or just water quality awareness. And so just our efforts to integrate those platforms, right, with protecting Florida together, making sure it is also a one-stop shop. You know, when you consider all of the efforts in your entry direction, Governor, to invest resources in blue green algae as another, you know, water quality concern. But also taking that data, that science and that information and assimilating it to one central location gives that comprehensive view that is so important as we think about the effectiveness of our actions, right, and what we're able to disclose to the to our stakeholders. And I think, too, just one more thing that's important. If you think about the efforts of the Blue Green Algae Task Force, right, we've got some amazing science on that task force. We've got some amazing science on this task force as well. And so if you think about the opportunity for those two task force to share information, to share new discoveries, to share thought processes, theories, again, just exponentially increases that potential when those two, two entities come together, And so, which I'm looking forward to doing right bringing those two entities together so they can also, you know, have a direct connection to be able to do just that, so. Great, okay. Dr. Crosby, Matt Marine. Yes, sir, and I, uh, thank you, Governor, for bringing us all together today to talk about this important issue. Um, you know, Moat and uh, our partners at FWC have been studying uh, red tide for well over 20 years, um, but I really want to applaud you and your partners in the legislature um, we've learned a lot about red tide and the dynamics over more than 20 years, but you and the leadership in the legislature came together to embrace a vision that we could work together, take the science, and actually do something with it to mitigate the impacts of red tide. As you mentioned, it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. There's no silver bullet that's going to eliminate it. But what we can use is the knowledge that we have gained to develop innovative technologies to decrease the impacts of red tide when it does occur. And that's what this initiative is, is all about. Um, to date, um, in a little over a year of, of this initiative, we have already issued three different requests for proposals to attract the best and brightest minds in science and engineering from not just the state of Florida, which is loaded with that talent, but from all around the United States and the world. We are bringing together the best and the brightest. We've already looked at over 125 different technologies and compounds. Um, we have had 75 proposals that have come in. We are currently underway with 25 different projects, 20 different partner institutions. We were looking at a suite of different compounds that can be used. We've already demonstrated several of them in small uh, studies in the field, but we're going through very methodically each one of these technologies, whether it is um, allelopathic chemicals that other organisms, other algae actually produce naturally chemicals to inhibit the growth of other algae like Karenia. Can we use those chemicals? Um, ozonation, robotics, uh, different kinds of light. We have uh, private companies, we have other nonprofits, we have other universities 
that are all coming together. And I am convinced, I'm convinced that this initiative is going to develop those technologies that we can deploy in different situations, whether it's a canal in, in a, um, in a, in a um, uh, resident area, whether it's offshore uh, beaches here in Gulf of Mexico, whether it's in Tampa Bay, Sarasota Bay, Charlotte Harbor, we're going to have a tool chest that is going to be deployable to mitigate these impacts to our environment, to our economy, and to our quality of life. And it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't, number one, based on good sound science, but number two, the leadership that you and your partners in the legislature have shown to embrace this vision to do something with the science. So thank you for that. What's the um, explanation for, like in 2018, particularly Southwest Florida, you know, real severe, and then 2019 was, was much better. Is it, do we know kind of what makes for worse red tide seasons that, than, than not? Um, I, I won't play an arrogant scientist and say, yes, we know, um, because we don't know all of the forcing functions. We have learned a great deal uh, about the combinations of uh, currents, uh, temperature, um, uh, biological competition or lack thereof. Um, but the key is red tide begins far offshore, 30, 40 miles, and you, you know this. Uh, you can give me a tutorial on it. Um, it. It comes inland when the currents are right, um, and then it takes advantage of the nutrient load that naturally occurs in the coastline of uh, the Gulf of Mexico here in, in Florida. That's why this is such a highly productive area. It requires that nutrient load to actually um, support that entire food chain and all the fisheries that we have. But when you get a little bit of a perfect storm, every year you're going to have red tide. And as Dr. Hubbard can tell you, it's always out there. Um, but when you get that perfect storm, if you will, of conditions both physical, chemical, and biological, then you get these blooms. And if the winds and the currents are the right way, it stays a little longer. If they change a little bit, we, we can separate them out. I would suggest, and, and USF is actually leading in this effort in terms of forecasting. They've got some great scientists here that are leading in that area. We can predict a hurricane much more easily than we're going to be able to force, uh, forecast red tide. And that's because a hurricane is built primarily on physical variables in modeling. Red tide includes in the chemical aspects of the right nutrients. Of the, there are over a dozen different nutrients that red tide utilizes. So the concentrations of those nutrients, but also the biological uh, component of competition within the ecosystem. So it's going to be a great challenge to be able to forecast red tide, but I think we're making great advances with our partners at USF on that. And that's why we've got to continue the partnership with FWC. You have funded them with the center there. That's instrumental to keep that science going and get even more knowledge. Great. Well, that's a great segue to Dr. Frazier. Yes, you know, and it's a pleasure to be here again. And I, you know, I want to thank you for the opportunity to oversee kind of the activities of the BNLG Task Force. And in that capacity, I had a, a tremendous uh, um, amount of time and opportunity to converse with those scientists and interact with the HAB Task Force as well. And um, one of the things that came out of that, obviously, is the need to, to reduce uh, nutrient inputs into our coastal waters. And, um, and again, the action at the state level allowed us to do that. We're aggressively moving forward. But it gets to Dr. Crosby's point, you know, I think what's on a lot of people's mind is, you know, did Piney Point, for example, uh, cause this red tide? And, and the answer to that is no, it, it didn't. Um, but what, what you saw uh, prior to the, to the Piney Point incident was uh, a fair amount of red tide um, down south, right? But there was a progressive movement of, of that red tide uh, along the coast uh, due in large part to currents and, and tides. And we do a very good job of forecasting that, as Mike said. Um, but it continues to move more uh, north, right? Um, and so, but the concern really is whether or not, uh, the, again, the Piney Point fueled uh, what we're seeing here off Pinellas County and up by Clearwater. And, and I don't think you can make a definitive cause and effect type of a relationship at, at this point. But what I can say is that we all understand that, that increased nutrient delivery to our coastal waters can exacerbate these blooms and then can kind of fuel them for some period of time. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the efforts on, on behalf of the state or on part of the state to reduce those nutrient inputs uh, moving forward. So that's, again, we're in a good spot that way. 
great. Okay, Gil McCray. Governor, it's great to have you at FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. We have been a, a hub for red tide research and monitoring for over 60 years. In fact, it was one of the reasons for our, our founding. The scientific name, Karenia brevis, for the red tide organism, honors a former director of the Institute. She's pictured up there in black and white. Karen Steidinger still works with us today, believe it or not, on red tide. So one of the issues over the years with our program, and again, it's been decades, is the support for funding. And we have a network of partners that's necessary to respond to red tide. It's a statewide issue. We need all the help we can get. The funding would rise and fall uh, depending on whether we had events or not. So if we went a few years without a severe event, the funding would drop and our ability to respond and maintain this network of partners would be diminished. So we want to thank you for your recognition that continued support is critical for keeping this network intact and responding the way we need to respond. People don't realize that every dot on that map, there may be two days worth of work behind a particular dot. The technology is just now emerging to automate some of the work we do with Red Tide. But the state of the art is still grab a water sample, bring it back to the lab, have an expert look at it to determine what's there in the water. And we'll evolve out of that over time, but right now we need an army of folks to help us do that, and we can only do that with continued support, and we appreciate your recognition of that fact. And one of the biggest things, the biggest two things are the, the reinvigoration of the Red Tide Task Force, which is already making a difference, making investments in public health, making investments in improving technology for detection, like I mentioned earlier, and actually framing up a communication strategy that's informed by emergency response, because essentially what we're doing in part is emergency response. But more importantly, the establishment and support of our Center for Red Tide Research, which is really, as I said, the hub for bringing the dozens of partners together that are necessary to do this work, and Dr. Kate Hubbard leads up that group. Great, okay, Dr. Hubbard. I just wanted to mention that the 2017 to 2019 bloom was not the only severe event. These, these severe events occur roughly every 10 to 15 years going back in history. And so with the recommendations of the Red Tide Task Force and the formation of the, the Center for Red Tide Research, as Gil mentioned, we've been able to work um, to really bolster our ongoing relationships with USF and Moat Marine Lab, but we've also been able to develop new partnerships with universities and partners across the state. And this has allowed us to really advance the types of research that we're doing to help advance um, cellular detection, to help look at uh, the connections between nutrients and how cells grow in the lab, um, to be able to take that back out into the field. And that really is important for thinking about how to deploy some of those mitigation strategies that are being developed. We also have a lot of new technology that we can deploy out in the field autonomously so that we can be out and we can be in the lab or out on a ship and we can be looking and seeing what's going on, um, having robots collecting data for us. And so these advancements have really made a huge difference in our ability to uh, work statewide to detect what's going on when there's a bloom, but also when there's not a bloom going on. And this is really critical for understanding the conditions that are important for promoting these blooms, but also for understanding what happens um, and, and what's going to happen when they're, you know, what, what might be causing blooms to go away um, naturally, but also, you know, how we might use that technology more efficiently, more effectively, um, and minimizing any potential harm on the environment. And so that um, extensive partnership, I think, has really been huge, and it's been uh, just something that we've been really, really proud to be able to help advance, and it's been a huge step forward. Great. Uh, well, thanks so much. Okay, M Marty Harity, um, can you just inter talk about uh, uh, Doc Fords uh, and, and where they are? It's a little bit uh, outside of this market, but it's a great spot. Well, I know you have, how many do you have now? Well, we have seven, seven stores. Yeah. And and one more coming. And, okay. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, how far? So you have Sanibel, Fort Sanibel, Myers. Sanibel, Captiva, Fort Myers Beach, uh, uh, St. Pete. Oh, you uh, do have one in St. Pete. We have one on the pier, and we're going to have oh, another one right. open okay. probably yeah. out of part of this year uh, for John's Pass and stuff. But, okay. uh, and we're very thankful that we have to be in this state. And thank you for your leadership sure. and, uh, and whatnot. I, you know, it's, the thing that's most exciting for me is to see the science and the environment and the, and the economy getting together. It's all the same. We all depend on one another. 
And, you know, I mean, in the past, like in 18, 2018 was devastating. There were no people here. There were thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish. And, I mean, and it comes and it goes and that kind of thing. But to have a, a focused task force now is going to stay on this thing. That's the most important thing. Accept that we have a problem and then address it. And, and you need that kind of leadership. And thank you for that, that we have that kind of leadership. Because we can fix this. Right? It's always going to be there, but you have to learn how to, to deal with it. And communication, I hear that. I use that word all the time in my business. You have to be able to communicate, whether it's with my employees, whether it's with my customers, that kind of stuff. You have to be able to communicate. When you hear red tide, right away it's like, oh, my God, the beaches are closed. And that's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. And, and, and again, to see this happen, I'm just excited in any way we can help. That's what we're here. Thanks for, for everything you're doing. So, uh, in terms of some of the stuff, and, and whoever wants to jump in, I know people have talked about different things. I mean, for like talking about like using some type of clay to, to treat it. So, I know like there's efforts to to test some of this. So, I mean, can you give us an update or anybody about like kind of what what, what technologies are and what what are the potential uh, promises? I mean, I think we, I, and I think you said this. It's naturally occurring. Um, it's not like something that's going to ever be eliminated. But can you mitigate so you don't have you know, 2018, or if 2018 happens, you can make it to where it's a little bit more, uh, you know, less devastating. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Governor. Um, and um, my colleagues over at FWC a moment ago were talking about uh, the critical need um, to develop new technologies, um, new ways to detect red tide, very, very important for the forecasting. But we also, this was the first of its kind. Nothing like this has ever been initiated, initiated this, this new initiative, uh, for six years to develop the tool chest, right? So um, where do you want to test these things? Okay, now in the 40s there was, uh, I, I think there was a call from someone in Florida for the military to come out and uh, bomb red tide. They thought, well, we'll bomb it out of existence. Then in the, in the late, um, late 50s, I think it was, uh, copper sulfate was sprayed on red tide. Um, we know how to kill red tide. That's easy to kill. It's how do you get, how do you decrease the impacts of red tide while not causing further harm to the environment because the environment is what it is all about. The culture of the state, the economy of the state is all built on this environment. So we had to build a whole new facility a testing facility as part of this initiative. And Governor, I'm going to invite you today. We just completed it. It is up and running. I'd love to have you and your entire team and, of course, our, our colleagues and our partners come down for ribbon cutting of this new facility where that is where we are testing all of these technologies before we take them out in the field to ensure that they're not going to cause greater harm. Now, we, we've we already demonstrated a patented ozonation process will work in small-scale um, canals. The clay technology um, is something that has been used for well over 100 years in certain areas of the world to deal with harmful algal blooms, but we've taken it to a whole new level to try to use smaller particles that actually have adsorbed on the outside certain compounds that will attract perennia. The density then uh, causes them to sink. But when do you use that, and when is it not wise to use it? Um, we're starting to look at quaternary ammonium compounds um, that are adhered to um, different uh, hard substrates that will decrease the impact. UV light. Small little robots, nanotechnology, we're starting to look at as well. And I think one of the most promising is Mother Nature's own, which is the allelopathic chemicals that other algae, algae that are naturally occurring here in Florida, um, whether it's ulva, whether it's gracilaria, um, there's other macroalgal organisms that extrude chemicals naturally to inhibit the growth of other algae. That one is also very, very promising. So we are now starting to focus on those compounds that pass through the first tests at a lab scale to go to these larger mesocosm scales at this massive testing facility, and then we will be going to field deployment. And that's what we'll have to work very, very closely with DEP, 
uh, with FWC to make sure we have all the permits in place to do the field testing to demonstrate proof of concept. And then, and this is going to be this next year, we're really going to have to start ramping up the engineering development to deploy this. This is not about Moat Marine Laboratory um, getting in a crop duster or a ship and going out and spraying this every time there's a red tide. We're going to grow a whole new science-based industry here in this state that is going to be able to use this advanced technology to be deployed against many different kinds of harmful algal blooms. So we're very, very excited. We're very positive about this. And Gill's point was absolutely on the target. The consistency of funding is critical, and that's why I think the legislature under with uh, your leadership has helped us to have that consistent funding for six years so that we will be able to develop this tool chest of technology. Communication, very, very important. Uh, we were talking earlier, the map that uh, uh, Eric was talking about, we have that on uh, our uh, um, visitbeaches.org. Um, that is the uh, beach condition reporting system. We're getting hits from people in Europe that are getting ready to come to Florida for their vacation. And they're accessing this data because they see in a newspaper article or something that, oh my God, there's red tide in Florida. And they're going, oh, should we go? Well, you access this communication device and you see the science and you see where the red tide isn't. It's very patchy. And we were just talking, I was talking with Mr. Harity, we're going, this is built on volunteer citizen scientists. All of his restaurants now, we're going to have a beach condition reporting system so that his folks can actually send out to Florida and the rest of the world. No, we're open for business, okay? That red tide is, is 50 miles down the, down the coast, not impacting us. Come to Florida. Um, so all of these, oh, also for the shell fishermen, we're developing a little widget um, that a shell fisherman, the very patchy nature of the monitoring system that we have, um, we can't get into fine spatial scales to identify. A shell fisherman has a clam bed, and he or she is going, oh my God, red tide's coming in, we're, get, we're getting closed down. Well, we're developing a little widget for these shell fishermen to put in the bottom of their phone that they can take a water sample, and it will go up to the cloud and to all the appropriate state and federal agencies to show the concentration of toxin and the concentration of karenia, as, as well as the actual tissue of the clam. So they can be told, yes, thumbs up, harvest now. You don't lose your crop. You're good. Or, mm, sorry, we're going to have to close you. So the economic impact is very broad, and part of this initiative is to help, in many different areas, decrease that economic impact. And we, um, I'll do it in a sec, that what they're doing, I mean, obviously we have the red tide uh, stuff that we're talking about today, and I'm, I'm excited about the progress. We also have done the blue-green algae, uh, primarily with the Lake Okeechobee, with the discharges. And we actually have technologies there that we're deploying. There was a, we had a company actually that we, we met in Israel on our trade mission, and they're deploying ways to be able it's biodegradable it basically will um you know will, will really uh, nuke the the, the blue green algae now that's a fresh water so but but and this is salt water but they we believe that what they're doing here could also have applications uh when you're looking at uh trying to mitigate some of the blue green algae i mean we're in a situation where we had a very high lake level historically about six weeks ago we haven't had as much rain and so it's probably something that's a little bit more normal. But nevertheless, looking ahead through the rest of the summer and the rainy season, you know, the Army Corps may be discharging. Now, we don't want those discharges during the rainy season, but the state doesn't control that. Uh, we're in a situation where we may be able to mitigate that as it comes in to the estuaries. Um, where we didn't really have that three or four years ago to really do anything. It was just kind of there. And I think the same thing's here. So I think that there's a, a, a lot of good stuff that will come of this, uh, both for this, but I think it could have broader implications, broader applications. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And, and I just wanted to follow up with what Dr. Crosby said. You know, there's a, a, I'm really excited to see the investment in the technologies, both on the red tide side of things and the blue green algae side of things. And, you know, there's real promising techniques, right? But you want to diversify your, your portfolio there, right? And so
so uh, some of those technologies are allowing us to better forecast and, and predict right on very small spatial scales uh, these bloom events on so right when they're getting formed because the last thing you want to be able to do or have to do is to you know deposit clay over you know a couple hundred square miles or something right you want to be able to identify it when it's formed get on it quickly and so uh, again I think we're making great strides in that area as well do we know maybe one of you um because it says, you know, the first East Coast, but I mean, this is more found on the West Coast than on the East Coast. I mean, I know it has been. What, what's the re Do we know the reason why it's more prevalent on the West Coast of Florida compared to the East Coast of Florida? It's largely because of the ocean currents. Yeah. And so it's something where we don't yet know exactly uh, the life cycle of Carinia brevis. So some of these algae have cysts or seeds um, and we don't yet know if that exists for Kernia. We know that it's always present in the Gulf. Um, and we know that the currents in the late summer and fall are conducive for bringing those offshore cells onshore and accumulating them. And so that's something that we've seen. Um, in 2014, we had a bloom that never made it onshore. It stayed offshore, and we've seen that sometimes in the past. Um, so it seems like southwest Florida is an area that's impacted repeatedly, but we do see blooms fairly regularly also in the Panhandle, um, and again, that's related to currents. When we do get blooms on the east coast, that's much less frequently, but they usually first make impact um, around West Palm Beach, and that's because of the bathymetry and, and how those currents carry the cells around the southern tip. And the Gulf Coast, as Dr. Lowe has alluded to, has a much broader relatively shallow shelf than the East Coast as well. Um, and as you mentioned, um, whether they insist and go down about 100 feet and just sort of sit down there at the bottom and then the right current conditions bring them up. Um, very different dynamics, although as you know, um, Indian River Lagoon and other areas have different kinds of harmful algal blooms. And it's very, very important, and I know you know this, Governor, but it's very important for, for the public to understand, each one of these harmful algal bloom species has a different life cycle pattern, different forcing functions, and as you alluded to, will require slightly different approaches to mitigating them. But as long as we're all working together on this, I, I think we're going to be able to actually leverage off of everything that the different initiatives are doing to, to really get a handle on harmful algal blooms across the board. And um, Sean, I know we had uh, Pinellas County had reached out to us about potentially uh, some support. Are you working to identify some resources to be able to help? Yes, sir. We've already reached out to them and engaged the county directly and trying to get a sense for what their you know what their expenditures are thus far and what kind of what that looks like long term, short term and long term. And so hopefully we'll be able to identify a source for them to be able to support them as they kind of work through this initial initial impact. So that's promising. 2021 so far, uh, how, how's it been? Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. And again, I mean, it's it's nice to be open and that kind of stuff. I mean, the red tides that are coming that we see, we kind of overcome a little bit. It's not the whole beach and so right. forth. You have to communicate that. So this is this is outstanding as far as going in that direction. But uh, we're going to have a banner year, a banner year in 2021. Right. No, it's good. And, and just, that's why when we did the... Um, you know, when we were down, we went down, I remember when 18, when I was running for governor, and we said this was something that, it, because someone will say, oh, there's 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 fish or something, you know, and this, and then the, the, the someone in Ohio thinks it's like on every Florida beach, and <laughs> this day it's just not. I mean, it's just, it's something that's very, even in the 2018, which was more, there was still, you got to look, and so having this information, being able to communicate that, and letting folks know, um, you know, that, um, that, that that these places are open, the hotels, the restaurants, the beaches are open, um, and that if there is an event that affects a particular location, you obviously will have the information on that. That. But um, you know, you have people thinking because you, know, you had something off Sanibel that somehow you couldn't go to St. Augustine or something. Um, and, and so the communication, it, it, it really people's jobs depend on on you communicating properly. People's businesses. We're really happy with how people are doing. I think what Marty's. Uh, um, you know, rundown of how they're doing is not uncommon in Florida. People are doing very, very well. I've, uh, every time I go out, someone will tell me, you know, thanks for, for, for keeping us open. 
not only am I doing well, usually in when they talk about this year, 21, a lot of times it's we are doing better than we ever have done. And that's something that's been common. So we're proud of that. Uh, but we also want to make sure that the communication is, um, is good. People have access to the accurate uh, data and, uh, and can be able to govern themselves accordingly. So do uh, you have anything else? Well, Governor, I, I appreciate you taking the time, appreciate your support. As I mentioned to you, one thing you can uh, count on is you've got the world's leading experts on this issue. And, and my job and Sean's job is to make sure we're all communicating in a way that the public can understand. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to continue to do. So thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Look, we obviously had to put capital behind getting the funding, and we've stuck to it. And even in a um, you know, difficult budget year last year, if we own it with the COVID hitting, we uh, made sure that we were able to, to keep our priorities and, and had to make a lot of tough decisions, but kept, kept the momentum going. So we want to continue to do that. And, and hopefully uh, you know, another year or so, maybe we'll do another update. You can talk about some of the other things uh, that we're doing. And, uh, and I think people really, really appreciate it. So, so thanks, everybody. With that, anyone have any questions for me or any of our esteemed panelists? I just want to make a, a subtle, you know, change to the words there. So I, I don't think that the red tide was originated as a consequence of Piney Point, right? So um, one of the things that we saw with the red tide early on was that it was south of the discharge area, but the, the, the red tide continued to kind of migrate or move northward and into lower Tampa Bay. And it's quite possible um, that uh, nutrients, recycled nutrients in the system as a result of the Piney Point could have contributed to that. But there are a large number of nutrient sources along the coast. And again, we've tried to address a lot of those nutrient sources, but there are, there are septic tanks, there are uh, you know, aging stormwater systems and uh, fertilizers from, from both uh, uh, agricultural use as well as residential use that can contribute uh, to um, nutrients in the system that can ultimately sustain and fuel those blooms, right? So I just wanted to make sure that Piney Point didn't cause it, but I didn't say it couldn't, it didn't necessarily contribute to um, uh, a subsequent high levels of, of red tide for a short period of time. If I could just add on that to give you some numbers, um, the total nitrogen pool in estuarine coastal waters um, that is available for use by any algal species, including red tide, about 95% of that nitrogen pool um, during these bloom events comes from zooplankton poop and dead fish um, that are decomposing and recycling. So the key to understanding the dynamics of this is this is a naturally high nutrient environment, the coastline of uh, Florida on the Gulf Coast. That's why we have such amazing productivity here. That's why we have great fisheries here. Um, so the cause and effect um, with land-based sources of nutrients causing red tide is not the smoking gun that you point at. Other harmful algal blooms, yes. Red tide, no. We need to clean up the coastal waters, and I think the legislature and this administration have done a great job in focusing funds on water quality issues because we need to have clean water for many reasons other than red tide initiation. Governor, um, I have a twofold question. To some extent, just how, are you concerned about what we're seeing off the Nellis right now? We're coming up on the 4th of July, um, you know, and, and, and like you said, businesses are trying to recover from the pan pandemic last year. And, Former Secretary Ballenstein on multiple occasions said that the goal is to hold HRK holdings accountable. Um, if any results come back that do tie the current red tide to those nutrients that came out of the pond, is there a mechanism in place to hold HRK accountable for red tide damages? Well, I mean, in terms of accountability, I mean, they, they caused a lot of expenses, even if you don't make that linkage. I mean, if you look at what's happened, all the mitigation that had to be done, the fact is uh, their mismanagement, that was a, that was a, a, a approximate, it was a clear and present danger to life and property of the people surrounding that area. That was why 
the uh, the DEP had to do the controlled discharges. It wasn't anything they wanted to do, but we were in a situation where this entire thing could have could have uh, been breached, um, and that would have caused catastrophic da localized damage there. But I, I think that anything that they did, if there was negligence, then just like anything in, in the law, I mean, whatever the uh, um, you know foreseeable damages are, you know, you could do it. I think it'd probably be a little easier to do some of the stuff we already know just to prove it than some of the other for the reasons Dr. Frazier said and the reason and Dr. Dr. Crosby said. So, but but yes, the DEP, they are going to do it. And look, we're ultimately going to put this issue to bed. We got a lot of money in the budget. You know, I went to the legislature and said this has been going on for decades. Uh, uh, let's mothball this thing. So I think the key is, is to have a, an effective plan, which I know that the, the agency is working on so that uh, if we're going to put this big money behind it, that, that it solves the problem. And, and I think people will, will really want to do that. You know, in terms of what we're seeing, I mean, this is, uh, I think, come to me, correct me wrong, this is not 2018. I think we see some localized. So check whatever, but this is a great place to be. I mean, there's very few places um, in this country that are, that are, as, uh, that are as nice as, as this Tampa Bay region. Uh, it's a great place to visit. It's a great place to, uh, to have fun if you live here. And, um, and, I, and I would absolutely anticipate having uh, a very strong Fourth of July weekend uh, for folks. And I think our businesses will continue uh, to do well. And uh, we really were sensitive throughout the whole last year. I mean, we're a service-based uh, economy here in Florida very dependent on tourism, very dependent on uh, hotel, lodging, restaurants, all this other stuff. And, um, you know, had we done like California type policies, I mean, we would have the highest unemployment rate in the country. I don't think there's any question about that. Instead, we have half a million job openings. You know, I actually just went, this is, I've seen this all over the state. I just went to get coffee on the way over here, Duncan. They don't open the indoors because they don't have enough staff to, to do. Yeah, they need people. So that's, a, you know, whereas I think a year ago, people thought that we would be, uh, you know, be struggle to put people back to work. Now things are going well, so people really uh, want jobs, uh, or the, the businesses want to provide jobs. And I think you're going to start to see more. I mean, obviously, we've transitioned to a pre-COVID unemployment uh, system, which uh, I think is better responsive to what's going on in the economy now. And I think that that'll have an impact, obviously, job search requirements, some of those things. So we uh, hopefully there'll be some, some relief there. But some of these restaurants would be doing even better. They have to actually close certain days a week, some of them, because of because of being short staff. So, uh, so that's where. We're, but I think it's. I think we're. In, I think we're. Uh, I think it's a great place to be. And I think because of the technology, the ability, folks have the ability to go see. But just understand what we're seeing is 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 more splotchy. This is not uh, 2018. And you know, hopefully, we don't see that this or any time any time in the future. We get the technology on board so that if you do have one of these severe events that do regularly reoccur every however many years that we're able to uh, to do some significant mitigation. Uh, Governor, Governor, uh, um, Oh, you're here. Yeah, yeah I, was in the, I was in the air. The election supervisors were having their conferences. Right? Oh, good. And, and there was a lot of confusion and frustration over the, over the new election law that you signed. Uh, but there's a question I tried to ask you a couple of months ago that I was not able to get an answer. I just want to ask you again uh, directly, do you believe that the 2020 presidential election was rigged? I think we had the best run election in this state that we probably ever have. Um, I'm proud of what they did. And look, I mean, obviously we had to do some things at the state level. I mean, I had to make some changes when I first came into office. I think those were long overdue changes. I think they were effective changes. Uh, we did not throw out our whole system because of COVID. We basically continued with what we were doing. Um, and I think it was very transparent, very efficient. And so I think what we did is important because when you look at things like Zuckerbucks, uh, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to basically run elections in different parts of the country. Some of these supervisors want those Zuckerbucks. I don't want the Zuckerbucks in Florida, um, but I think that that was, that was very shady how that was done. So we banned that. I think some of this ballot harvesting that you see across the country is a huge, huge problem. So we're able to ban that. Um, so I think we did the best. And I think that we're staying ahead of the curve. So my message to Floridians is uh, you know, your vote counts here. Uh, it's important. And, and don't let anyone tell you that, that, that the vote doesn't count. Uh, so we're proud of what we did. But you, okay, you one, more. Go one more. I want to ask you, are you sending, about, uh, sending officers to the border? Do you know how many, when, 
Maybe you might kind of sure. on a little bit. So, yeah, great question. So we got the, the EMAC request from Arizona and Texas. Uh, we responded positively. I think other states are now going to determine. So they have certain needs writ large. Obviously, Florida's not going to be able to fulfill all that. Uh, so I think once we see what some other states are going to do, we'll be able to do. So once we have that, we'll obviously provide uh, the, the figures. We don't have that yet because it's still being a work in progress. But at the end of the day, uh, Florida has been the beneficiary of mutual aid from states when we've responded to our natural disasters, and it's something that we appreciate. We've also provided aid. I mean, we had people out for the California wildfires when those were real bad uh, in the not-too-distant uh, past. And so we've, we've supported, we've received support. Um, I have no doubt, hopefully we don't have any major storms this, this hurricane season, but if we do, I have no doubt that we would get support from states like Texas uh, to help in our efforts. So I think it's the right thing to do. But I do also believe that what's going on there is impacting communities all across the country that are not necessarily on the border. I met just a couple weeks ago with a number of our rural sheriffs and mostly in the northern part of the state. Their number one issue by far is the meth that's coming into their communities. And whereas 10 years ago, you'd see these different places where they cook the meth and they do this and they do that, uh, they say it's almost all of it coming from across the border now and that's coming in. I think that's accelerated, obviously, in the last six months. Uh, I think what Texas and Arizona are doing is really all that they can do. If they're not getting the federal support, they've got to try to step up and try to mitigate some of the harmful impacts that we're seeing. But I do believe that if that border is under control, that will uh, relieve some of the flow uh, of the methamphetamine that, that's coming into some of our communities. And it's a, you know, if you look at a map of Florida, you know, some of these rural, rural areas, the incidence that they have of methamphetamine overdoses, I mean, it's, it's pretty dramatic. And, it's, and I think when I met with the sheriffs, that, you know, and we're going to help them directly on the ground as well, uh, and we're working through ways to do that. But it was literally like issue one, two, three, four, five was meth. meth. It was all related to, to the methamphetamine. So I, um, I'm sensitive to that, and I think that what's, what's been going on has been, been a big, big tragedy. And, and the thing that makes it so tragic is it's been avoidable. There was not a crisis uh, January 20th um, on that border. Uh, not that saying that everything was, was resolved, but, I mean, it, it, was, it was the policies were working, and those were all thrown out, I think more for political or ideological reasons, and the result has been uh, what, what we've been dealing with now. So uh, will we, but we will definitely, uh, any, uh, any personnel, state personnel, state equipment, any assets that we deploy will obviously uh, 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 let everyone know. And then as the sheriffs and some of the local jurisdictions uh, produce either personnel or any type of um, equipment, you know, we'll obviously uh, let you know. But, you know, we, we, we got the request just a couple days ago. We thought about, okay, like, yeah, we've got to help. We asked the sheriff, man, all, a lot of these sheriffs immediately were like, yes, we, we want to be involved in that. And that wasn't us saying you had to do it. I mean, the sheriffs you had with me yesterday, uh, those are folks who's, um, who, who want to answer the call. They've got deputies uh, that, that are rearing to go as well. Okay, I'm going to run. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. When was the, the task force reorganized? Was that 2018 or 19? When I came in in 20, so this was part of what we did in 2019 when I became Thank governor. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, you guys sat there. Hi.